previously on Discovering the Risen Jesus. Jesus had died, been buried, and rose again. Now Jesus was popping up around Jerusalem and encountering people as they went about their normal days. Jesus just keeps popping up. He keeps surprising people. After Jesus rose from the dead, two of his disciples were on a seven mile walk to their hometown, and Jesus showed up. And as they walk, we learn. Jesus meets people on their road, where they are going in the flow of their life. These guys aren't in a temple, they're not in a church, they're not in a religious place, they're just walking down the road. That's where Jesus met them. When we hear their conversation, we discover. Sometimes people don't recognize that Jesus is with them. You, people can be walking right alongside of Jesus and not recognize it. Jesus reveals his heart. Jesus is curious about what is on your mind. He wants to know. He wants to hear from you. Then they end up sitting at a table to share a meal and something staggering happens. He took the bread and he gave thanks. See, there's so many times in the gospels, he took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it. And he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were open and they recognized him. Jesus just sort of dropped the veil. And then, then they're at the table, they're like, it's Jesus, and watch what's next. And he disappeared from their sight. He never did this before he rose from the dead. So they told their story. They walk in the room and the other people go, it's true. Peter saw Jesus and they go, it's true, we saw Jesus. And we walked along and we didn't know who it was. We had this conversation, we sat down, we had a meal, he broke the bread and our eyes were open and Jesus, and then he just disappeared. So what happens next? So these two disciples who've traveled seven miles from Jerusalem now experience Jesus at the table. They recognize it's him. He disappears. They hurry back to Jerusalem. So this is what we were looking at last week in last week's message. They hurry back to Jerusalem. And now they're gathered with a bunch of the disciples. And some of the women had seen Jesus at the tomb. So they're saying, we, we saw him. We experienced him. We really saw him. And, and then Peter shares, I've seen Jesus. And then these, these two men, uh, Cleophas and the other man, who've come back, said, we, were, we were walking with him. We didn't know it was him. And then, and then we sat down for a meal. And then when he broke the bread, we recognized him. And then he disappeared. So they're all gathered in this room. And have you ever been in one of those situations where there's some people that know what's going on, and you're kind of like, I don't totally know what's going on. I'm not totally in the loop on this. Well, there's people in this room that had seen Jesus. So they're like, they're convinced. We've seen him. He's alive. He's risen. But there's other people in the room that are like, well, I, I wasn't there. I didn't see him. This is all going on. And, and then into this setting, Jesus shows up. And that's what we're going to look at today. When he shows up again, and this, this group of people who, who hadn't yet seen him get to experience Jesus. But I want you to watch how they responded to him. And, and, and we're talking today about no fear, but an open mind, an open heart. Not being afraid, but being open to the presence and the power of Jesus. And I want you to notice also that, that Jesus was the same Jesus when he rose from the dead, but he was also different. Before he rose from the dead, if Jesus wanted to get from one place to another, he walked there. Or occasionally he rode on a donkey. In this case, he's in Emmaus, and they walk back, but Jesus just kind of like, boom, he's back in Jerusalem. The risen Jesus could make it so you couldn't recognize who he was. He was the same Jesus, but, but he was different. And we're going to pray that God would open your eyes today to see the risen Jesus. Like those people gathered in that room, say, say, Lord, open my eyes to see the risen Jesus and know that his presence is shocking and it's beyond comprehension. That, that when you actually see Jesus, it's going to be shocking to you. That, you. that you might struggle with what it is that you're seeing, who it is you're encountering, but it's Jesus there with us. So we're going to begin. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 24. It's where we left off last week. We're going to pick up right after, right where we stopped. In Luke 24, beginning in verse 36, and this is what I call the text we believe. We believe as Christians and followers of Jesus that this book is true. As Christians, we only have one book. It's the Bible. We only have one Savior. His name is Jesus. So we hold to the truth of this book, and we hold to the person of Jesus. So look with me at Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. We'll have it on all the screens, but it's also in your Bibles or on your Bible app. So it begins in verse 36, while they were still talking about this. So where you pick up in the passage is where we left off last week. It's saying, okay, these, these two people, Cleophas, the other disciple, were on walk, walking. They walked with Jesus. They didn't know it was him. 
He was going to keep going. They asked him to stay. He stayed. They sat at the table. He broke the bed. They recognized him, and he disappeared. They've hurried back to Jerusalem. Now they're in this room. Some people have not seen Jesus yet, and they're kind of like, well, we don't know if he's really risen. We haven't experienced his resurrection presence. They're talking about it. Some people are telling their story, well, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. While they're talking about this, okay, look at the passage. In the middle of the conversation, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Jesus is just there. The text is not saying he you know, knocked on the door. Can I come in? Can I join you? They're talking about Jesus. And you ever been in a conversation where somebody's like telling their story and they're really animated. So everybody's looking at that person and paying attention. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there. Have you ever had anybody walk up like behind you and you didn't know they were there and they said, hi, and you went, wow. You're like, oh, I didn't know you were there. Well, all of them had that response. Because they didn't know, because Jesus just, Jesus just showed up. So at, at that moment, um, I would dare to say that they were startled and frightened. I mean, they were startled. Now, you say, well, how do you know they're startled and frightened? Well, let's look at verse 20, 20, uh, 37. They were startled and frightened. Ah, there you go. Um, is pastor making things up? No, they, you know, they're, they're all, when Jesus says, peace with, be with you, they all go, whoa, because he's there. They're talking about how he had just showed up at the table and they'd seen him. And now he shows, so now all of them get to see Jesus. So now all of them, what do they do? They all go, oh, now we totally believe. We're in 100%, right? No. All of them struggled with doubts. If you're a Christian and you sometimes struggle with things, you're in good company. If you're not yet a Christian and you're trying to figure out the Christian faith and you're like, I just struggle with some of those things, that's okay. Jesus understands. And I love how Jesus responds. They were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. I mean, they had seen him nailed to a cross. They had seen him die. They had seen the, the, the soldier thrust a sword in his side and water and blood came out. He was dead. They'd seen him put in the tomb. And now here he is. He's right there. So they're frightened. They're startled. They think they're seeing a ghost. He says to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? And I love this. Jesus says, look at my hands and look at my feet. He shows them the nail hole that went through his hand. He shows them his feet. He's saying, it's me, it's Jesus. He's the same, but he's different. He's alive again. He's bodily risen. So he shows him his hand. He says, look at my hands, look at my feet. It is I myself. He says, touch me. You know, touch me and see. He's saying, now, they're, they're all doubting some. So he says, look at my hands, look at my feet. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus is clear. It's him, the one who was on the cross, the one who died, the one who was buried, the one who had risen again. He wants them to understand because his resurrection is central to our faith. Now, years ago, the first church I served in, right out, I was still in high school, and I was volunteering at this church, and it was kind of a bigger church. Down, it was called Garden Grove Community Church down in Southern California, and the preacher there, the pastor there, had a very interesting Easter experience, one Easter. He was in the middle of preaching, and as he's preaching, Easter Sunday, a guy comes walking in the back door of the worship center and starts walking down the center aisle while he's preaching. Long, flowing hair, a white robe, looking a lot like Bible storybooks, pictures of Jesus, kind of a picture. And he's walking down the center aisle, and he says, I am Jesus. And at this moment, you're wondering, okay, has the pastor planned some kind of a interesting, dramatic thing? Or, but no, the pastor had not planned this. It was a guy who, and I'll be sensitive in our world, I'll say a guy who had some, probably personal life issues and challenges. He was confused. So he's, this guy's walking in the church while the preacher, the preacher stops preaching. He's walking down the aisle and he says, I am Jesus. Now put yourself in that, even if you're not a preacher, what do you do at that moment on Easter Sunday when a guy who's dressed like and looking like Jesus is walking down the aisle saying, I am Jesus? What do you say? What do you do? Well, this pastor, I think kind of inspired by God a little bit, this pastor says, show me the nail prints in your hands and your feet. Pretty good, huh? You know what the guy said? I had them removed. That's what he said. And, the, and here's what the pastor said. My Jesus would never have those nail pins removed because he died for us. Ushers, will you take this gentleman to kind of talk and visit and we'll talk after the service and ask them to kind of take him out of the room. Pretty, you know, good response, right? Be kind, but, you know. But here, here Jesus is, he's risen, this is the risen Jesus, and he says, look at my hands, look at my feet, it's, it's me. 
He's the same, but he's different. Now, before we continue with the passage, I want to give you an invitation, okay? And here it is. Let's give Thomas a break. We're so hard on doubting Thomas. Oh, doubting Thomas. He didn't believe. He doubted. Let's give Thomas a break. Everyone was shocked and struggled with the reality that Jesus was right there with them. All of them thought this is a ghost. They, they were all struggling. So, so later on, and, and this all happens, and Thomas isn't there. It's not till the next week when they're gathered that Thomas is there. So for a whole week, Thomas is struggling because he doesn't get to see Jesus' hands and his feet. He doesn't get to experience this. And we're always so hard on oh, Thomas doubted. How could he doubt? Well, here's the reality. All of us struggle with some doubts. Whether you're a Christian who still doubts about, you know, struggles with things, or whether you're not a Christian trying to figure out the Christian faith, there's times where we ask questions and we struggle. And Jesus didn't get mad at them for asking questions. He, what did he say to them when they were doubting, when they were thinking he was a ghost? What did he say? What's wrong with you people? You know what he said? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Touch me. I'm not a phantom. It's really me. I've really risen. But he did that for all of them, and he was standing right there with them. And so let's not pick on Thomas like there was something wrong with him about doubting. This was pretty much how all the disciples responded in this moment at this time. So let's continue on in verse 40 of Luke 24. When he had said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement. Have you ever said, it's just too good to be true? They're so overjoyed. They're so amazed. They're like, Wait, we're amazed, but can, could it be that Christ is back, that he's really, and, and so they're, they're grappling with this. When well, they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, I love this, watch this now. Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate, he took it and ate it in their presence. What's going on here? Why is Jesus asking for, he's like, oh man, I've been disappearing here and popping up there and I'm exhausted. I mean, you know, this, this, this popping all around. Is, that, is, that, is he exhausted and needs a little fish to eat? Is that what it is? No. Why is he asking them for fish? Somebody, what's he? Because he's going to eat it in front of them. And they can watch him go like this. Mm, mm, mm. He's saying, I, it, I'm, I'm risen. I'm, I'm the bodily resurrection. Nail prints in the hand. Nail prints in the feet. It's, but he's not a phantom. He's not a ghost. He's truly risen. It matters that Jesus died on the cross bodily because he died in our place. It matters that he rose bodily because the resurrection is real. So he's showing them as he's eating this fish. I love this. It's like, okay, you don't get it yet. You don't understand. What can I do to help you understand? That's how much Jesus loves us. He knows we struggle at times. He wants to bring us along so we can fully understand and fully embrace who he is. Jesus is ready to help us move past unbelief to full embrace of who he is. Jesus is ready to take you. So if you're, if you're a Christian, but you still struggle with some stuff, Jesus says, just keep walking with me. Keep learning. You're going to understand more and more who I am. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep pressing into who I am. I'll show you. When you have doubts, that doesn't scare Jesus. Keep walking with him. Ask your questions. Talk with other Christians. Grapple with things. But also, if you're not yet a Christian, and there's always lots of people. One of the things I love about Shoreline Church is there's people with us every time we gather who, who would say, I don't believe in Jesus yet, but I'm interested. I'm curious. I mean, Shoreline was started for people who didn't understand all the church stuff. And so if you're not a Christian, you're going, I'm, I got doubts. I got struggles. That's okay. Stay here. Stay with us. Hang out. Keep listening. I remember when I became a Christian, I grew up, in, and some of you don't know my story, I grew up in a home with, with no faith, kind of an intellectual, atheistic, agnostic kind of a home. And I remember when I became a Christian and told my dad I was a Christian, he kind of, he, it was kind of confusing for him because he, they didn't raise us kids to believe in Jesus and to go to church and that kind of thing. But I remember my dad at different times, I remember at one time sharing with my dad the simple story of Jesus that he died on the cross, he rose again. And he offers forgiveness. And all we have to do is receive his forgiveness. And you turn from our, our sins and turn to follow him, receive his gift of grace, and begin walking with Jesus. And my dad said, that just seems too easy. I mean, that, that's fair. I mean, you know, just, okay, all my sins, all my wrong, I just give them to Jesus and boom, I'm, he just, that just seems too easy. I remember saying to him, dad, it was e it's easy for us to receive it. But I said, it wasn't easy for Jesus. He took all my sins and all my shame and all my pain. 
And I remember my dad saying, I just don't believe it. I remember later on in another conversation, and I, you know, my wife Sherry had so many conversations with my dad before he became a Christian near the end of his life. I had many conversations with my other siblings who one by one, all five kids in my family became Christians and all of us prayed for my dad and different ones were sharing with him at different times. And, and he'd, say, he'd said to me one time, oh, I, I believe that Jesus really lived and I believed he was a good moral teacher and a good person. And, I, and he said, oh, yeah, I believe these things. He said, but the idea that he was God who came with among us and died for us, I don't believe, I, I just, I doubt that. And it took, it took 43 years of people praying for my dad and sharing with him to him finally, to finally say, I get it. I see it for me. And I receive Jesus. So if you're still asking questions, you know what? That's a good thing. Asking questions, is, if you're not yet a believer and you're grappling with those things, and this is a church where you can ask questions and talk to us, and, and, uh, and if, you, if you're really asking a lot of questions and you want to talk to us, come and let me know, and there's actually some groups that meet together and ask those questions with you and talk about them, we'll, we'll build a bridge and connect you there. But then the passage continues on in verse 44. So he said to them, Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus says, I had to die. I had to rise again bodily. These things had to happen because it's written in the law of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets. Here's what Jesus is saying. The first, our, the first two-thirds of our Bible is called the Old Testament. Okay, so the, first, the whole first two-thirds is all what happened before Jesus came. And it's all pointing to Jesus. It's all saying the Savior's gonna come, the Messiah's gonna come, and then Jesus comes. And that's where the New Testament begins. The last third of our Bible, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the way through Revelation, is when Jesus came, when he walked on this earth, when he started his church, until he promised, until he ascended to heaven, and then built his church, and then one day he'll come again. So all of human history is right here in this book. And so Jesus says, Jesus says to them, listen, all this had to happen to fulfill what was written about me, about Jesus, in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And so we have to ask ourselves a question as a Christian church. Do we believe this book? Because let me tell you something about the Christian church. Everybody, all, all eyes on me for a second. You gotta get this one. This is a big deal. We have just one book. Amen. All right, we have just one book. I'm gonna ask you to say that back to me. We have just one book. Yes. Okay, that's what we have. And I'm going to say something, I want you to repeat this. We have just one Savior. We have just one savior. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. All right, we have one book, we have one Savior. And if we're not focusing on this book, if we don't stay, if we don't stay locked on the truth of this book, and if we don't keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to wander. And that's happening in lots of places. And can I tell you something? Over the last two years, the last two years have been a very unique time for the church, for Shoreline Church, but for every church. And I have friends who are pastors all around the world. I've had lots of conversations with lots of pastors over the last two years. And over the last two years, there's been a lot of pressure from a lot of people even inside the church saying, let's focus on this, 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 all, whatever, whatever is the hot cultural topic that's going on. In the last two years, there's been probably about a dozen different really big issues that have hit our culture, that have hit the church. And I have people in the church saying, well, we should be focusing on this. And I, and I say, actually, we're going to focus on this and Jesus. We're going to focus on the Bible and Jesus. And as for Shoreline, we have been relentless about keeping our attention on God's word and on Jesus. And I think that's, that's what's kept us healthy and strong through all the storms we've been walking through. Now, to be very clear... All the topics, all the things that have hit the news that have been in people's minds over the last two years, they're all important topics, and they're all worth talking about. But are we going to stop what we're focused on and what we're doing as a church to turn our attention? It's, it's almost kind of like we're focused on Jesus, focused on his word, and then you've got squirrel, 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 you know, and, and everybody's going, focus on this, focus on this. And, and we've just kept saying, no, we're focusing on the word of God and on Jesus, and when the word of God leads us to pay attention to all those topics, which by the way, the word of God speaks to every topic of life. So when the word of God calls us to focus on those topics, we'll look at those things and we'll address those things and we'll do it biblically, but we're not gonna just kind of work with whatever the news cycle is focusing on and keep shifting depending on what the hot topic is because the world doesn't define what the church focuses on. Amen? Amen. Jesus does. And so that's been the focus of Shoreline Church and I believe that, that that has kept us on the solid rock during this season. And then the passage continues in verse 45. So then he, Jesus, opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Listen to those words. Jesus opened their mind so they could understand the scriptures. You should open this book every day 
And when you do, you should say, Lord Jesus, help me understand your word. Shape my life by your word. Keep me from trying to shape the Bible to fit my life. Forgive me when I take my preferences and my ideas and impose them on the Bible. Forgive me, Lord. But let me see what your word says and then, Lord, shape me and my life into what you would have me be. Because to follow the word of God, to follow the word of God is the, is the only way to live. It's the best way to live. It's not the easiest way to live. It can challenge you at times. But it's the best way to live. And so Jesus, he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what was written. He's going back to the Old Testament. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead and on the third day. And in repentance and forgiveness for, of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So he's absolutely clear that we're going to now preach this truth that we've heard, that we know, right from where we are to the ends of the earth. And then he says, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will come upon the church. We're going to focus on that on Ascension Sunday, some weeks down the line at the end of this series about how Jesus ascends to heaven, but then he sends the Spirit to come down among us, all right? So he says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. That's the Spirit of God. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So, when our minds embrace and understand the scriptures, things begin to make sense. Jesus begins to reveal what the scriptures mean. And so I will tell you, as a Christian in our world today, when we know what this book says, and we believe what it says, and we let the truth of God's word shape our lives and our hearts, that's when we begin to walk the kind of lives that he wants for us. And it is challenging. There are all kinds of voices screaming for your attention. There's all kinds of opinions and perspectives that don't line up with God's word. But can I tell you a little secret? That's the way it's always been. You go back to the first century. The first century view of almost every topic you can imagine was against the Bible. It's like, well, all this stuff is just like, it's our modern world is so mixed up. Yeah, our modern world is mixed up. Guess what? The ancient world was mixed up. There were, there were cultic temples where people, people would go to cult prostitutes. It was part of the organized religion of the day. State-run prostitution as part of religion. That's kind of messed up, isn't it? We don't have that today. At least not here in our country, right? But, but there, was, <coughs> there were all kinds of false teachings, all kinds of wrong ways of thinking. And so, here's my, here's my pastoral challenge to you. I want to challenge you to open this book every day of your life. To make it a commitment. And you, you might get busy and miss a day, but don't let it be two or three days. Just open up this book. Open up this book. There's a reason why every single week we give a seven-day reading plan that's on our church app. It's on our church website. Every week, every week, every week. There's day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you open up your app or you open up the website, if you like print things, then just take it and print it out. And, every, and tuck it in your Bible, and every day, open it and read it, or listen to it. A lot of people like listening more than reading. That's fine. Just get the word of God in your heart and in your mind. What you'll find out is after a week of doing that reading, when you come to church on Sunday or when you're online on Sunday, you're going to go, man, this sermon is all about what I've been reading all week. Because we planned it that way. <laughs> we actually take time to prepare those Bible passages for you to read. So if you go, I don't know where to read or where to go in the Bible, I challenge you to do that. And make sure it's time for you to meet with Jesus, and that you say, Spirit of God, risen Jesus, speak to me by your word. Make it come alive. Speak to my heart. Speak to my life. And really, ask, ask him to speak through the word and to speak to your heart. So this morning, I was up early, and I wasn't working on my sermon. My sermon was done a long time ago. I was up this morning, and I went into my study, and I sat in my chair. And I thought about yesterday, and I thanked God for some good things. I got to be with five pastors from our community yesterday. I spent about four hours with these pastors and their wives just having lunch together and talking about Monterey area and how we love this community and how we're trying to serve Jesus here. I got to go to a concert last night with worship leaders from those five different churches together leading worship over at the fairgrounds. So I just wrote down a few things I was thankful for. Then I opened my Bible. I've been reading through the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament and 1 John in the New Testament. So this morning I was in 1 John chapter 4. And I just read chapter four and I prayed about it and I said, God, what do you want to say to me? And how do you want to grow me and make me more who you want me to be? Can I tell you something, Shoreline Church? I wasn't reading my Bible this morning for you. 
I wasn't reading it for a sermon. I wasn't reading it for a class I'm gonna teach. I need to sit at the feet of Jesus and let him speak to me. I need that every day. And so do you. So I'm not a pastor. It doesn't matter. If you're a Christian, you need the word of God every day. And let me say, if you're not a Christian yet, and you want to start to understand the Christian faith, start reading this book. Use the Shoreline you know, Weekly Reading Guide. Just use that and see if God doesn't begin. And even if you're not a Christian, say, Jesus, I don't even know if you're real, but if you're real and if you rose from the dead, will you speak to my heart? You'll be amazed at what God teaches you through his word. So as you open this book every day, as you read God's word, and as you ask God to speak to you, here's my other word of encouragement. Come to the Bible with this attitude. God, I am not coming to make the Bible fit my ideas, my thinking, and my lifestyle. I'm not, God. I'm coming for your word to shape my thinking and my ideas and my lifestyle. Those are two radically different things. We don't come to the word of God, to the Bible, and say, let me find the things that agree with me and ignore the things that don't. We come and let it speak to our hearts and our lives. And then we shape our lives to God's leading. That's a lifelong journey. And as you do that, what you find out is the world is throwing all kinds of things at you and saying all kinds of things to you that have nothing to do with what this book says. And then you gotta say, am I gonna follow culture, the world, my family, my thinking, or God's word? And it's always, always, you will, you will have a much, much, much better life if you'll follow the word of God and not your own thinking and the world's thinking. You may not have an easier life, but you'll have a better life because you're aligning your life with the word of God. And so Jesus is so clear, he wants them to understand the scriptures, to follow the scriptures. So, so when our, our minds embrace and understand the scripture, things begin to make sense, things begin to come together, and we've got to hold to that and follow that. So here's a question for you. Can you see Jesus then speaking to his followers, the risen Jesus, uncovering the scriptures, showing them what they mean, talking to them about how the, the scriptures point to him? Can you see Jesus then? And can you see Jesus now saying to you, know my word, follow my truth. In this, in this world where it seems like there's no anchor to kind of keep your life stable, that God's word and God's truth and Jesus, that's our anchor. And then open your ears and hear the risen Jesus. His message is unchanging. If you, if you read the word, God will speak to you. The risen Jesus will teach you how to live your life. So just in this passage, there's what I call the, you know, the truth we embrace. Just in the passage we looked at today, if you study this passage closely from Luke chapter 24, and you look at this passage, you go, well, what do I learn from Jesus from my life? There's a ton here. Here's some of the things you learn in this passage. Jesus says, receive my peace. Jesus says, receive my peace. He wants you to walk in his peace. Even when you're afraid and nervous and doubting and struggling, he says, receive my peace. Peace be with you. Jesus says, live with assurance and confidence. You should live confidently in who he is and what he's done. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the prophecies. All the Old Testament prophecies, Jesus says, they're completed in me. Hear him say that. Jesus says, I am the suffering Messiah. See, the ancient people who were looking, waiting for God to send a Messiah, here, here was what happened. In their minds, they decided the Messiah was gonna come in and crush Rome and be a political Messiah to set them. The Messiah is gonna come and take over the political system, crush Rome, and set us politically free. And Jesus didn't come the way they expected, the way they wanted him to. He came as the humble, suffering servant. So Jesus points out that, you know, that in the prophets, it said he would come as a humble, suffering servant. They decided what they wanted Jesus to be, and when he wasn't what they decided he should be, they didn't want him. Don't do that. Find out who Jesus is, not who you want him to be, and follow who Jesus really is. He says, I'm the fulfillment of the prophecies. I'm the suffering servant. I'm the suffering Messiah. Jesus says, I'm the risen Lord. I've risen. He says, look, you can touch me. You can feel me. I've risen from the dead. Jesus says, I'm the source of forgiveness. The grace and forgiveness come through Jesus. Jesus says, I'm sending my spirit to you. My spirit's gonna come upon you and be with you and be among you as my people. So here's the question. Can you hear and accept the words of Jesus? Can you open this book and say, God, what do you have to say to me? And while the world's screaming, while your, old mind is, your own mind is saying, but I like this, I like this, I like this, and when friends are saying, what about this, what about this? And you say, I'm listening to the word of Jesus. I'm gonna follow and live in the word of Jesus. 
You say, well, that's so hard in our world today. Yeah, it is, but it's been hard in every generation because every generation has voices speaking and, 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 you know, and political input and social input and input from the arts and all these different places. And some of it's good, some of it's neutral, some of it's bad, but this is true. And we hold to the teaching of Jesus. And then finally, will you open your life to follow the risen Jesus? Where you say, I want to look at these things that Jesus has taught and what he said, and I want to walk in the ways of Jesus. I want to follow the path of Jesus. I want to live like he wants me to live. And I call this the trail we walk. What, what does it look like just to walk with Jesus? The risen Jesus. If we discover the, 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 the living risen Jesus, how do we follow him and walk with him? What's this trail we walk? And I want to ask you to do something as we, as we close. As you just quiet your heart. If it helps you, you can close your eyes and, and kind, of, kind of put yourself in a place of kind of prayerfulness. You, you don't have to, but just, just listen. And I want to just share some things that Jesus teaches us in this passage. And ask yourself, is this the trail you need to walk? Maybe God will just quietly say in your heart, this is for you. This one's for you. So here's one thing that Jesus shows us when we walk with him. Will you become a peace-filled bearer of peace? Jesus comes to you and he says, peace be with you. Peace, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Would you walk through life carrying the peace of Jesus in your heart? And because you carry that peace in your heart, when you walk into a room, that room become more peaceful. When you walk in the room, do people say, oh yeah, she's here. And they feel the peace of Jesus. They don't even know what it is, but boy, there's peace. They say, oh man, he's here. He brings peace. Or when you walk into a room, do people go, oh, she's here. Oh, he's here. Oh boy. Things are gonna, things are gonna get pretty, you know. What, what happens when you walk into Rome? Do you need to say today, do you need to say, Jesus, if I'm gonna follow the risen Jesus and walk in your presence, and you've said, peace be with you, and you've given me a peace that passes all understanding, Jesus. Maybe you need to say, Jesus, let me walk in your peace, and carry your peace with me. Let me be filled with peace and overflowing with peace. Maybe that's God's word for you today as you walk with Jesus in this world. In this trail that we walk as Christians, if you're a Christian, how about this? Do you walk through life walking with Jesus confident, boldly confident in who he is, yet deeply humble about who you are? Do you have a bold confidence that he is risen, he's alive, he's savior, but you have a humility and a gentle spirit because you don't have all the answers. You know, when you walk in the room, do people say, there's somebody who knows what they believe. They don't compromise. But they're also not a jerk. They also aren't coming always acting arrogant like they have all the answers. Bold confidence with a humble heart. Maybe that's the God speaking to you today. You need to walk and live that way. How about this? As you follow the risen Jesus and walk with him in this coming week, will you walk as a person who is forgiven and forgiving? Forgiven and forgiving. Do you walk through life side by side with Jesus knowing that because he died on the cross and rose again, all your sins are washed away? As far as the east is from the west, he's removed your transgressions, all your sins from you. Do you walk through this life so deeply forgiven by Jesus that you can't help but forgive others? Or do you have a list of people that you've said to yourself, I will never forgive her. I will never forgive him. And if you're walking with the risen Jesus who washed all your sins away, is it time to say, Jesus, help me forgive like you forgave me? Maybe that's God's word for you today. And one last thought. As you walk with the risen Jesus, are you receiving the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and overflowing with the Spirit wherever you go, filled with his power, filled with, with his truth, filled with his grace, with the gifts of the Spirit overflowing, ministering to others? Does the Spirit of God fill you and overflow through you? Because when you walk with the risen Jesus, the Spirit of God is present in you and working through you. And maybe today you need to say, Spirit of God, remind me every moment that I'm walking in the presence of the risen Jesus. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today as we close this time together. Jesus, we've sung songs of praise. We've given gifts to you. 
We've given back. We've prayed together. We've studied your word. And Jesus, we have a vision, a picture of you, Jesus, showing up and meeting people right where they were. Jesus, you are so patient with your people. You're so patient with us. But Jesus, this is our prayer. As we walk into this new week, may we walk in the presence of you, Jesus, the risen Lord, overflowing with forgiveness, confident in our faith, yet humble in how we interact with others, knowing that we are washed clean and extending grace to others, walking in the power, O oh Lord, of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us walk in your peace and share that peace with others. May we be different this week in how we live and relate to other people because we walk in the presence of you, Lord Jesus, our risen Savior. Shine your light in us and through us, we pray for Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, I'm gonna have you stand wherever you are and I give a word of blessing, but I wanna give an invitation before I do that, and that is that, that we do a new members class about every two months we're not a church that really pushes membership, but we also want to know if you want to serve and get engaged at a deeper level, you can become a member of Shoreline Church. If you're in the military or only here for a short time, most of those folks decide not to become a member, but they become, uh, we, we call it a ministry partner. It's the same commitment, but it's only for like eight months or 12 months as long as you're in the area. But if you want to know about becoming a member of Shoreline or a ministry partner with Shoreline for this next season, I do a class today at 12.30, so the class is going to be in about 25 minutes, and the details up there in the Pacific Room, uh, which is just right across the lobby here, and 12 to 2 o'clock. That, that class is live here on campus and online, so if you're online and you're like, well, I'd like to jump into that, and again, half our congregation is online still, so if you go on the website right now and you register, what will happen is I'll have a big monitor in front of me with all your faces that are online, and then everyone in the class like this, and so I get to actually have people online right here and the class right here, and we're all together as a church family. So if you're online or on campus, you say, I want to know more about you know, what Shoreline believes and what membership means and how to be engaged more in the church. Join me for that class. It's about an hour or 15 minutes or so, and we'll, we'll talk about what we believe, our mission, our values, uh, what it means to be a member of Shoreline Church. If you want prayer, if you're online and you want prayer, just call the number you see or send us an email with your prayer needs, and we'll get that to our prayer team. If you're on campus here, we're going to have folks up front here. We've got folks over here, over here. We've got three teams ready to go. And if you're outdoors in the courtyard, family worship venue, worship center, and you want prayer on campus, come on inside of here and join our prayer teams. They would love to pray with you. And, uh, and we're, we're so glad that you can do that. And also, if you're new, if you're online and you're new, just text the word WELCOME to the number you see on your screen, and we will send you a, a welcome card and connect with you. If you're on campus, anywhere on campus, just go right into the lobby, and we want to, there's a, in the Connection Center, they want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming. Answer your questions. Give you a warm, personal welcome. If you're able to stand wherever you are, outdoors, at home, indoors, would you stand with me so I can send you off with a word of blessing? This Wednesday, night of worship, 615, online, courtyard, and here in the worship center. So I invite you to be a part of that. And as we close this time together, may you walk every moment in the presence of the risen Jesus Christ. May his peace fill you and overflow. May his forgiveness astound you and overflow. May the presence of the Holy Spirit be so upon you that you sense the presence of Jesus in all you do. God bless you. Have a good next couple of days, and we'll see you back here Wednesday night, 6.15, night of worship. Have a great week.